world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Good morning to Peter Hitchens from the Man on Sunday. Peter, how are you? Good morning. Shall we begin with an imaginary conversation between Messrs Putin and Johnson and what on earth it could ever be about? Well, I suppose it will probably begin with uh, with Putin saying who. <laughs> I, I don't think the Russians care all that much about Britain. No, uh, it's we're not we're not high on their list of preoccupations. Uh, we think that they are, and no, no doubt the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, who thinks she's world queen, thinks that we are. But I don't think they really they know, for instance, uh, that we have a tiny and diminishing army. Uh, a shrinking navy, much of which stays in port, which is actually very like their navy, which is uh, in, in, even more clapped out than ours, I should point out, uh, and very little influence in the world. But I suppose out of politeness, uh, a call would be taken. But I think that half, half the problem with this is that the, the Western countries, uh, or many of the Western countries, are imagining uh, a coming invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which they keep saying is going to happen. And the Russians keep saying, well, actually, no. And th this morning, interestingly, the, the president of Ukraine has been saying, well, I'm quite sure what this invasion is you're all going on about. Uh, it seems to be something which is, exists entirely in the minds of Western statesmen. Is it a sort of um, Peter Sellers movie-style invasion? I mean, that's what it's becoming, beginning to look like. And apologies to anybody who's not old enough to remember who Peter Sellers was. But, I mean, I do wonder as well, when you see stories over the weekend from, I can't remember which cabinet minister was threatening it, but, you know, oligarchs, Russian oligarchs will have no place to hide in London. And you go, well, you know, most of them are hiding in the Dorchester bar. It's not quite not that difficult to find them. They're all hanging about in the very expensive uh, bars of all the very expensive hotels on Park Lane. Well, no doubt there are a lot of, of, of Russian oligarchs who got their money by all kinds of extraordinary means hanging out in Britain, and no doubt you can make life inconvenient for them, but I don't think it would make very much difference to, to Russian policy. But let's return for a moment to what is this supposed invasion? Where did it come from? What is the evidence that it's going to happen? And Russia says uh, that it's free to move its troops around on its own territory, which is a normal rule. Uh, it says it, it has no intention of invading Ukraine. And the reason why this is believable is that it would be stark raving mad for Russia to invade Ukraine. Mm. I, I don't have much doubt that the Russian army, which has recently been quite substantially modernized and, and made a good deal less drunk than it used to be, uh, could probably equip itself reasonably well. But once you start fighting people on their own territory, which they would be doing, things would go seriously wrong. And then you'd have the problem of holding it down. I don't think any sane person in Russia imagines that you could reconquer uh, Ukraine by force of arms. E assuming you could take it physically, then you've got to hold it down. Everybody knows that's the hard bit. Why would you do that? Uh, breaching international law, probably bankrupting yourself, quite possibly leading to a huge crisis of, uh, in, in, in Russia, which would bring down the government. I can't see what's in it for them. So I, I just wonder if we shouldn't be questioning this idea a little bit more. Yes, but is this also the case of, of sort of learning from the White House, where whenever there was a crisis domestically, um, whatever American president happened to be in charge would threaten some kind of foreign action and get everybody's minds uh, very much focused on another part of the world so that they couldn't look inside what was happening at the White House? No, I think there's a bigger game going on here. I think a, a lot of people in, in Western diplomacy have begun to understand that they've been pushing Russia around too much for too long and that it, it has to come to an end. Uh, in fact, there is an existence, an agreement between Russia and the Ukraine guaranteed by some Western countries called Min Minsk II, uh, which would not solve this problem, but certainly make it a lot easier. It would deal with the, uh, the current... Uh, horrible mess in the Russian-speaking areas of the Don Basin and, mm. and turn Ukraine into a, a more federal country. Uh, the thing is that this agreement, having, as far as I know, been, been agreed to by, all the, by, by, by Russia and, and Ukraine, has never been implemented. And it's, it you, depends on who you listen to to work out who it is who, who's, who's actually got in the way of this. But the problem with it is, is that it would turn Ukraine into a, a, a much more federal country, more mm. like Switzerland. Uh, in which the, the Russian speakers were, were given a good deal more local autonomy than they have now, and, and their language a, a good deal higher standing than it has now. And there are uh, people in, in Ukraine, particularly the Western nationalists from around Lviv, as it's now called, uh, who object strongly to that, who want Ukraine to be, to be a wholly Ukrainian-speaking country, in which the Russians, Russian speakers pretty much take what they can get. 
And that's half the problem, that Ukrainian nationalism is opposed to the sort of compromise which would bring peace and ultimately prosperity to a country which, if only it were properly governed, could be one of the richest and happiest countries on the face of the earth. It's, yeah. just a, it's, a, it's a horrible corrupt slum at the moment because it's, it's so unstable and, uh, and it spends so much of its time involved in being used as a battering ram by Western countries against Russia. Yes. Yes, I mean, it is a very, very difficult situation, I suppose, but, I mean, I can't imagine what um, the arrival of Boris Johnson will do to, uh, to pour oil on troubled waters, really. Well, not much, but can I just say this, make this point here? Whenever you hear or read anybody prosing on and on about Ukraine, ask yourself how many of them have even mentioned the Minsk II agreement if they even know it exists uh, or, or what it says, mm. because it's extraordinary how it, this, this this perfectly good diplomatically arrived at way out of the crisis just doesn't get a look in at the moment. Mm. And I, it, it just suggests to me that, that I, I, for many years, I mean, I don't claim to be an expert on Russia or Ukraine, but I have lived in Russia and been to the Ukraine as a reporter. Uh, for many years, on the, everything to do with this argument, it's been a positive disadvantage to know anything about it. Uh, the, the, the much easier to join in the chorus mm. uh, of, of, of wicked Russia and wonderful Ukraine and uh, this, this strange business you will have noticed now, more and more news organisations calling Kiev, which is the English name for the, for the city, Kyiv, K-Y-I-V, right. as a sort of politically correct yes. uh, kowtow. We now, it's now one of these countries. Uh, where we have to change the spelling of everything <laughs> to please them yes. to show that we're on show that we're on side. Well, don't do that. The English name is Kiev. It yes. always has. Been. They don't do it with Moscow, obviously, do they? Oh no! If people, if people started calling it Moskva, which is how it's actually pronounced mm. in Russian, everyone would say, Who, "Where is that?" Yes. Yes, it is a curious... Uh, if, if I pronounced Sevastopol in Russian, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. It's interesting, actually, because that leads us on to the next point that you wrote about this weekend, and that's Wales, because I noticed when I was working in Wales many years ago that all of the um, road signs were printed both in Welsh and in English, and as was the uh, the word Hedlu put on the side of police cars, because police apparently is not what you call them in Wales, you have to call them Hedlu. Hedlu, apparently. Uh, or Hedlu, sorry, my apologies. Yes, so I'm uh, told. As in, well, you're probably right, actually, because it's Cymru, isn't Wait. it? Uh, with the U pronounced yeah. with an I. But that's the thing. And the Welsh Language Act, I had a friend who lived there in uh, Chepstow, uh, which was just on the other side of the bridge, and he was English, and his daughter went to a Welsh language, a Welsh school, and by law she was taught the Welsh language. Now, I don't have a particular problem with that. However, lots of sort of what you might call ultra-nationalists in Wales would like you to call places like Cardiff and Swansea and Clenechley by different names. Um, and it is a kind of creeping change of language, isn't it? Well, it's, 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 it's the way that these things proceed. Now, I, I, like you, perhaps more so, I'm very much in favour of the preservation and strengthening of the, of the Welsh language. There's some fantastic literature in it which w would die out if the language were not spoken. And it, it's, a, it's a shame that it's been diminished as much as it has. And quite a lot of native Welsh speakers probably feel quite cross about the way that language was marginalised. Mm. So nothing wrong with that. Uh, if people in Wales want to use Welsh and call names places by Welsh names, that's great. But requiring other people outside to call, uh, to call them by Welsh names is different. Some years ago, I went to Ukraine. This is the last time I went there properly uh, to write about the problems there. And language is a big problem there. And one of the, the points that I made was, was that what was happening in the Russian-speaking areas was as if Wales had become independent and in doing so had incorporated Devon and Cornwall mm. and begun to impose the Welsh language on Devon and Cornwall right. so that you had the police called Headley in Exeter. And, and this is what was going on in, in Ukraine. And a, a lot of Russian speakers found it quite uh, hard to cope with. You can go to the cinema, for instance, and the, the films were in Ukrainian, which right. they didn't speak. Right. Uh, and there was no... Uh, the, the Russian... <laughs> Is is a is 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 not an official language. Uh, Ukrainian is the official language, and that's that's one of the ways in which this this um, almost triumphalist uh, Ukrainian nationalism dominates a lot of a lot of life in that country, to, which makes it harder for Russian speakers, who many of whom are very happy to be mm. living in Ukraine and are Ukrainian patriots. It makes them harder to to actually live there, and I, it's pointless. I think the, the, the federal idea incorporated in the Minsk II agreement is actually rather clever uh, and would solve that problem, would enable U Ukraine to flourish, which I think every civilised person wants it to do. Mm. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Let's talk a bit more about Wales and Mark Drakeford. Uh, you made an interesting point about something that he had said, um, which more or less kind of distanced the way the Welsh government runs itself from almost anywhere else in Britain, didn't it? 
Well, it may, uh, Scotland is very similar. It's just interesting what, what Mark Dra Drakeford had said. And, and I noticed that Janice Turner at the time, who by, by no means shares my political opinions, has spotted it too. And that, uh, that, that Mr. Drakeford, in, in, in contrasting his, uh, his, his government's uh, performance with the English ones, saying, well, we believe in, in collectivism and they believe in individual freedom. And as, as Janice Turner said, he spat out the words in individual freedom with a certain measure of dislike in them. I think that there is a big difference between Wales, uh, less so perhaps, and, and Scotland very much more so, where it, there's, there's a strong belief that, uh, that, 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 that Scots will say that, that I am my brother's keeper, that, that interfering in other people's lives is, is more justified in, in, in Scottish thought than it is in English thought. And this is a big difference. And it's becoming very important. And it used to be that in England, the idea that the, the freedom under the law was it. And after that, you were left to your own devices. Uh, whereas in Scotland and perhaps Wales, things are a bit different. Uh, it's now in, in England, the struggle is going on. What the point about Drakeford's, uh, Mr. Drakeford's uh, interview was that it suddenly made it clear what this has been about from the start. Collective authoritarianism, based on a belief that the government can save us from peril and, and is is our guardian, and liberty under the law, under which we free to get on with our own lives, and that is what this has been about from the start. Yeah, because collectivism presupposes everybody agrees, doesn't it? Which, of course, they don't. Well, it presupposes those who are in the minority having to put up with what the majority tell them what to do, and this is this is majoritarianism, which is a, a, a form of dictatorship. Mm. Uh, if you happen to be in the minority in, in such an arrangement, then that's tough. You just have to abide by what the majority say, whereas what you ought to have is an adversarial parliament in which both sides agree to compromise on, 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 on such things, and you don't get pushed around and forced to do things which you fundamentally don't want to do. Mm. Good talk. Hot talk. talk. Bold talk. Talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio.